Hello all. We got a pretty hefty boundary value problem, so let's get this started. The statement reads, a point dipole P is embedded at the center of a sphere of linear dielectric material with radius big R and dielectric constant epsilon R. Find the electric potential inside and outside the sphere. All right, so to first tackle this question, let's uh, consider the net dipole moment at the center of the sphere. P prime is equal to P minus chi E over one plus chi E P. And then that whittles down to one over epsilon R P. Since we want the potential produced by P prime, which is at the center, and the boundary charge sigma B at R, we need to consider the potential of the sphere, uh, which we solved back in chapter three, uh, which we see in the piecewise definition for outside and inside. Uh, note that we had to apply the boundary condition of the field inside that's produced by the uh, dipole. So that's why we have the one over four pi epsilon naught uh, times P cosine theta over epsilon R, R squared. All right, so moving forward. Um, so like with all our other boundary value problems, we need to apply a couple of different conditions, namely the continuity at the boundary R and the normal derivatives. Here we see that we have two cases because that initial uh, potential had cosine in it. We're going to have a case for L not equal one and for the case of L equal one, which we've seen in plenty of other problems. For L not equal one, we have that BL is equal to r squared r raised to the 2l plus 1 times al that's pretty simple just use your uh, orthogonality exploit that again cancel out what you can with the cosines um and then for the case where l is equal 1 we can go ahead and plug that in and we see that b1 is equal to p over 4 pi epsilon naught r uh, and times epsilon r plus a1 r cubed again that's just some simplification um, moving forward, so we're going to have to take the normal derivatives, but we know that, that taking the normal derivatives is equal to the bound charge, uh, sigma B over epsilon, not, uh, the negative of that. Uh, but we know that the bound charge sigma B is equal to P dot R hat or N hat from the definition. In this case, that's R hat. Uh, but we also know that P is equal to epsilon not chi E, uh, times the electric field uh, so plugging all those in and bring it back to where the electric field is now the negative gradient um, of the potential we can write this uh, expression with the normal derivatives all in terms of the potential so we don't have to calculate any bound charge or things like that uh, so these derivatives do get messy so be careful of the negative signs and exponents things of that nature and where you evaluate them again you should have no little r's anywhere because these are all evaluated at the boundary um so let's go ahead and chug that out we see that we have this expression here and then that's equal to an expression multiplied by chi e again that's because we substitute it back in from the bound charge all the way to the potential Moving forward, again, as we discussed, we're going to have a case for L not equal 1 and L equal 1, thanks to the potential having cosine in it. Um, for the case of not equal 1, we see here that we can compare the coefficients and things start to whittle away. We multiply by R raised to the L plus 2 and then simplify down. We note that we get some cancellations here, or excuse me, we substitute in BL. And then that uh, simplifies down to what we see here in the second line. And then again, we cancel the R's. Uh, we move that factor on the right-hand side over so we can factor out an AL, only to see that that whittles down to AL uh, will eventually go to zero. And because we have an expression for BL, which is multiplied by AL, BL also goes to zero. So that leaves us with a pretty easy case of just L equal one. So we plug in everything from the coefficient perspective, from the derivatives that we just found. Uh, let's multiply through first by a factor of uh, r cubed and divide by 2. And we see that we can get some simple uh, simplifications there. 
so that we can substitute in what we found earlier from the continuity equation for B1, which we see here, uh, again, in the third line, make sure to apply the negative sign to both of those terms. The negative sign, therefore, cancels this P over 4 pi epsilon uh, naught times epsilon R term. And then we're left in the fourth line with a bunch of expressions. Uh, but I took the A1 term from the line before it and put it on the left-hand side. So we see that we can finally factor out everything to do with A1. Uh, we notice that the negatives cancel. Uh, and then we're just left with a uh, equation that we can now solve for A1. So we do that, we get everything isolated, uh, multiply over by 2 uh, over r cubed, 3 plus chi e. Uh, now we can just substitute in the definition for chi e, which was epsilon r minus 1, and we can simplify it through, so it helps a lot. Um, then we just back substitute that back into the definition we found from the continuity equation for b1, and again simplify through, makes life easy. Now we just have to put all this together. Now that we know what the um, coefficients are, we can substitute them into the potential. Again, this is all for the case of L equal 1. So V out is equal to B1 over R1 plus 1, and it's the first Lagrange polynomial, which is just cosine. Substitute in B1, and we see that we get cancellations of the dielectric um, permittivity, epsilon R. Um, now moving to the potential inside, we have this little mess out front of the A1 coefficient uh, due to, again, the situation we have. Plug in A1 and then we factor out a lot of stuff, uh, mainly P cosine over 4 pi epsilon naught, epsilon R, um, and of course, uh, one thing to notice when factoring though is that for the uh, term with the cosine on the right, uh, we have to put in, in order to factor out a, 1 over r squared, we have to put in a factor of r squared. So that's how we get the little r cubed in the answer bracket. So that's just a math trick. Don't worry too much about it. But yeah, that was our, uh, our 40th boundary value problem of this book. So hope you're used to it by now.